Okay, so the last time we were here, we were working with this project, June 12th. Now, this will be an example of what do you do uh, to continue your project. Previously, we started to write our code from scratch, but here I want to continue a project. If you were to double click on the June 12th file, it would open up in the web browser. It would process it. I don't want that, I want the code. So just double clicking the file sees that it's an HTML file and then it'll load it in the browser. Uh, we want to open it in Notepad. So we have a couple of ways, but one is the fastest way. You can right click June 12th and there you've got the option uh, edit with Notepad++. That of course assumes you've got Notepad++ installed in your computer. Uh, once you install it You'll be able to right click Notepad, just about any file. We'll go ahead and open Notepad June 12th. The other way to do it is to open Notepad first, and then go to File Menu, Open, and select that file. Now, this is different than Edit, because that will probably open Microsoft Word or something, and we don't want that. So, make sure Edit with Notepad. Plus, plus. Okay, so um, have you figured out yet the keyboard shortcut to run your code from Notepad? It's totally easy to remember if you look in the Run menu. It is Alt, Control, Shift, X. Now that's a joke. That's not easy to remember. But if you look at it, you might remember it eventually. Uh, Control, Alt, Shift, X. So it's basically every little command thing. Every menu, or often many menus, have some sort of keyboard shortcut. You look on the edge. You can, I didn't know this one. You can do a Wikipedia search. Alt F3, apparently. The browsers are up there. And with practice, actually, you can, you can use one hand to launch it, especially uh, like Firefox, because the keys are together. You know, you may press Control, Alt, Shift, X, but with practice, with one hand, your left hand, perhaps, you'll be able to hold Alt, Control, Shift, X with one hand and execute it, run it, and you see the result. So this is what I have so far. We've started this recipe project. The last thing that we did was we added a picture. but we hadn't specified any other aspects of the picture yet. We just said, here's our picture. So based on my code, or perhaps your code, uh, what line number uh, is the line where we define our picture? On the left side, we have line numbers. 25. 25. In my case, 25. It may be a little different on yours. That's OK. We have line numbers, and this is one of the hallmarks of a good text editor, simply line numbers, so that we can talk about where is our code. If your lines don't line up, that's OK, but you need to then be aware of how to get to the piece of code that I'm talking about. All right, so IMG, SRC, uh, then the name of the file. That's the most basic. Uh, aspect of an image tag. We're saying this is an image and we're saying its source is this picture. I'm going to make a comment below it. Image tag with source attribute. These notes again are for yourself hopefully to so that they stick you're free to make as many notes as you want in your file. Oh, one thing before we continue. Remember to mute your devices, please. If you haven't uh, muted your phones or laptops and such, please take a moment to mute your devices. OK, so other things we can specify here. In my case, depending on the size of my browser, I think that picture's too big. 
it's going off the edge of the screen. What if this was a mobile device or a tablet? This is kind of the size of a mobile device or tablet, this size here. And if a person is checking out my project and then they come to the picture, it's going off the edge of the screen. So we have more attributes to edit the size of images. This is page 100. We have the width and the height attribute. We will see that when we start to add attributes, it does not matter the order of where you write your attributes. I could define a width or a height first before defining a source. That will work. Um, later, when we get to JavaScript and CSS, it does matter the order of your code. So we've got source attribute. We'll add another attribute inside of the image tag. Width equals quotes space uh, height equals quotes. And here you define sizes in pixels. Let's say we write 100 and 100. Save it and run it in the browser. And then see what you did. Well, 100 by 100 creates a little image. That's actually a bit distorted. The original image, if I go back, was a bit of a rectangle. It was wider than taller. It was a rectangle. And I forced it here to a square. And it's not so obvious here, but it's obvious on other pictures. Uh, that when you change the size without proportion, it looks really distorted. So one trick is, if you only specify one of the two, the other one will automatically specify itself and stay in proportion. So I like to simply uh, set a width and not a height. Check the result there. Only setting one value of the two keeps it in proportion. It'll stay like a rectangle instead of squishing it to a square. So save and run that and see the results. See, it's slightly different. If I put them side by side, that's the one that was forced into a square shape. That's the one that was normal. Now that you look at it, it's obvious, but it was being distorted. And that's the correct proportion. Now, if you note uh, at the end of page 100, the size of images is increasingly being specified using CSS rather than HTML. See page 409 for more info. So you have to wait 300 pages to really style and resize your pictures. So let's jump 300 pages for just a moment. I'm going to make the note here. Can use uh, width, height, attributes, HTML attributes. but CSS is better. Let's see on page 409 for a moment. On 409, it's kind of getting a little more complex than I want to. So we'll do the abridged version. 
Okay, so we saw having width or height is an HTML attribute. We have an attribute where we can apply CSS styling to any element. Let's do it that way. Let's add an attribute called style. This means style sheet. This means CSS. We're going to style this element in a better way than the basic HTML element. Use style equal style attribute for better CSS control. Within style, I then specify CSS code. So we're going to touch a little bit of CSS code, um, you know, a little bit beforehand within the book with colon space 100 px semicolon. It's written in a different way. Look at this syntax here. Previously, I had width equals 100. It assumed pixels. Here, because we can specify many styles, we have to write it this way. The uh, CSS attribute and then the CSS value. So co uh, with colon space the value 100 and then the units px and then a semicolon. So make sure it's written in this way. Question? So let's say if you want to do, if you want to specify the height as well, but you just put space and then in the same code. Mm -hmm. Space, height, 300 px, semicolon. Let's give that a try. So here is width and height. And notice what separates them are the semicolons. One value, uh, one name, property of style, semicolon, another named property of style. So we need that semicolon in between each thing we're editing CSS. Yes. What if you have con um, if you have two of the same uh, elements? Elements. So, like, if you have um, width <coughs> equals two fifty, and then you put in style, and then you say width two fifty to the There is going to be a conflict if you try to define things more than one way, but when we get to CSS. CSS stands for cascading style sheets. And cascading is the fancy way of saying, how do we figure out which takes precedence? Because a cascade like a waterfall, you know, falling from top to bottom, there's, a, there's an order to that waterfall. So later, when we get hardcore into CSS, we will talk about that conflict and how it's resolved and how we can resolve it how we want. So set a CSS property. Value separated by semicolon. So this does the same as before. It's almost like way too much typing. Previously, I could have just done width equals 100. Done. Here I have to set an attribute style and then width and spaces and all of that. So as of right now, this is too much effort. Uh, to edit to edit images because the result is a styled image that's very distorted. But this is the preferred way and the more powerful way because we'll do one more thing then we'll go on, which is we can add a drop shadow to this. In the old days, I would need to open Photoshop, add a drop shadow, check it out, save it, put it into the page, then think, well, I don't like it. Let me go back to Photoshop and change it. Um, with CSS, we can quickly create a drop shadow. This is somewhere else, a few hundred pages in the book, but we can do it here. Um, another attribute, I'm only going with, uh, with semicolon box dash shadow colon something 
semicolon. So when we get into CSS, we will be very used to the syntax, some CSS property name, and then a property value, semicolon, property name, property value. Some of them have two, two words, so there's a dash between them. Notice it's all lowercase. We've been typing all of our code lowercase, colon, something, some values, semicolon, the end. This is a statement, so to speak, CSS. Here's another one. We put 50 more if we wanted. Box shadow is a little different because it needs more than one value. Width is just one value, 100. But we need here, just let's write it for the moment, then I'll explain it. 5px space 5px space 5px space black. There are spaces in between each of these values. All of this are values of that property. Save it and run it. Drop shadow. So we've been going up to these 100 pages or so with HTML, which is just defining the content. Here's a few paragraphs. Here are a few bullet points. Here's a link. But styling. Um, and design that CSS. And I'm introducing two quick things here. We can use style of width and height and box shadow to create some interesting visual design. Now, hopefully, you're curious. Yes? Uh, in CSS, can you like always do instead of pixels, like percentage? Yeah, we have other units we can use, pixels, percentages, even inches and centimeters, although we don't really want to use real-world units in a web project. But yeah, we have other units. Now, you may be curious, or I hope you're curious, that besides what I do, you try other things. You read ahead in the book or you check websites. For example, here, if I were to leave it as is here and say, let's move on to page 102. Hopefully, you would have said, well, what happens if I change that to a 6? What happens if I put red there? You know, I hope you're curious and kind of change things and see what happens. Um, you know, just changing these values. What happens if I put a 25 there? Well, look at how much it moved over. So basically, this first value is the x offset. x to the right. This shadow is moved 25 pixels to the right off of the object or element, 25. That one was set to 5, and it looks like this has moved down, because if there's x and y, down 5 pixels. If I put a higher value, it should move it even further, 55. I'm moving that shadow so much it's on top of another element. Well, we have x and y coordinates. Um, we have negative numbers. What do you think happens with negative numbers? Opposite way. Negative 25 for the first value moves it to the left. Positive values move to the right. For x, negative values move up, which is counterintuitive. You would think positive y values move up and negative values would move down, but here it moves up negative values of y and down positive values because we're starting with the starting point of the top left corner of this picture. Positive x is to the right, positive y is down. The picture is here, so positive values down. Negative y values go up. Negative x values go to the left. Now you tell me, what does the third value do? Blur. Blur. It makes that edge crisper or harsher. If I put 15, it's even blurrier. If I put down to 1, 
it's almost snow blur. So you can achieve a lot of interesting effects by playing with these. And then obviously the last value is color. <coughs> you don't have to have a, a black shadow. You can have a red shadow, a yellow shadow. And later when we talk more complexly about colors, we can have transparent colors. Technically, there's no transparency here. There's nothing behind it. But we could uh, do transparency later. Here's a trick. If you put 0, 0, 5, red, check what that does. Check what happens with no values of x and y, some amount of blur, and another color. This creates a cool glow. So we can do a lot with CSS. Sizes of elements, positioning, columns, shadows, lots of cool things. Yes? Could you use, um, you don't have to use red or you could use X colors mm -hmm. if you wanted to, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. We'll talk about different ways to write colors a little later, but yeah, hex colors, RGB colors, RGB and alpha colors. So you can leave that however you want. I'm going to put it back plain old 555 black, and that's fine. So that was our digression for CSS. We'll come back to it a lot later. Set CSS properties, box shadow for drop shadows. X offset, Y offset, blur, color. We have a few more attributes for images. We have source attribute. We saw width and height attribute. We just introduced style attribute. And again, I hope your curiosity is piqued because yes, you can attach the style to just about anything. We'll talk about that later. We have a couple more attributes. Page 99, alt, and title. The order of these doesn't matter, but I like to leave style as the last attribute in all the possible attributes of an element. So I'm going to back up before style and I will add title attribute. Title is the text that will appear when the person puts their mouse over the picture. You've probably seen that. You visit a website, you put your mouse on a picture, a little bit of text appears. That's title. Tasty cookies. So now when I hover my mouse over that picture, the title attribute pops up. One of the most important attributes that we should add to an image is the alt attribute. So after title, I'll write alt, A-L-T. For the moment, I'll write the same thing. <coughs> Actually, let's write some tasty cookies. Title and Alt. Both of these are human readable sentences. They're expected to be read by people. 
rather than a web browser or a machine. You hover over title, you see tasty cookies. If you save and run this, you don't normally see the alt text. I don't see it anywhere. I don't. I hover over. I, I don't see it. The point of the alt text, like I said, it's one of the most important tags. Here, oops, my image is broken. It's corrupted. It didn't load up. Look at that. It's displaying the alt text. If an image doesn't load up, if it's corrupted, if it gets moved, deleted, alt text is an alternative to the picture. So alt text appears as the placeholder. Um, page 99, the second column on the bottom row says, the text used in the alt attribute is often referred to as alt text. It should, be, it should give an accurate description of the image content so it can be understood by screen readers, screen reader software, and search engines. Screen reader software is used by people with visual impairments. So one of the laws um, that we have is for websites, for government websites, they should follow Section 508 compliance. This is a law, a federal law, which says any government website must be accessible by everyone, all people of the US. So if I am visiting the IRS website, I have, if I have my glasses on, I have good vision. But if I had, uh, if I, if I couldn't see the website, I would probably have software that reads the website to me. Um, therefore, alt text will be read to the person. Because the smartest computers, when they come across a picture like this, they don't quite know what's there. Some pictures, yes, like the Eiffel Tower, the Statue of Liberty, you know, the Coronado Bridge, these things, the computers, they have a record of what that is, so they can tell you, that's the picture of the Statue of Liberty. But it's not going to be able to tell you, that's a family photo of my family in 1982 in front of the Eiffel Tower. It can't tell you that. The alt text is what will tell the computer that. So when someone that has a visual impairment visits my website, the alt text will be read to them, or else the computer is going to read from top to bottom and get to the picture and just say picture. So this is a law for governmental websites to have alt text. It's not compliant if it doesn't have alt text. You say, OK, great. I'm never going to work on a government website. I'm not going to get hired to work on government websites. This has become so popular for government websites that all other websites have basically adopted it too. Walmart, Nike, all of the big websites have alt text because uh, they want their sites to be accessible to as many people as possible. I want everyone, if I'm uh, Nike CEO, I want everyone to buy my shoes. If I'm uh, you know, uh, Target CEO, I want everyone to use my Target website, even if they have a visual impairment because People that are completely blind can use the web if it's properly set up. And a very simple thing like this is one way to do it. What is the alternative to that picture? A simple description of the picture. You will be compliant and you will be a professional web designer if you simply use alt text in your images. So another note here. Be sure to use alt attribute for section 508 compliance.
look at page 101. There's a few pages here uh, that are kind of theoretical. I'd like you to read them at some point. It talks about, uh, you've got a picture, page 102 shows you, you can align your picture in different sorts of ways, although none of them look really nice. Page, next page of 103 and 4 show you the old way of aligning an image to the left or the right of a block of text, but notice it's marked as old code. So basically skip pages 103 and 4. It's the old way. And when there's an old way to do it in HTML, what's the new way? CSS. So it tells you over on page 411. You can look at that on your own later. We won't at the moment. But there's CSS to align your pictures. So you can just note 103, 104, skip those pages. And later on, we will look at page 411 and 412. 105, 106, also old code, skip it. One hundred seven, one hundred eight. talk about the rules of creating images. Save images in the right format, save images the right size, and measure images in pixels. So you can read that on your own. What are the right formats? We're already using one here, JPEG, JPG. Uh, right size. We had an image that was a little too big, so we had to resize it. The book says it's better to have your image the right size already instead of using this code to resize it. Because sometimes what people do is they take a photo, and the huge high quality photo in their camera is too big. And they think, okay, I'll just resize it with CSS. The problem is the image is still huge, that file is still huge, it still needs to download. Just because it's shown small doesn't mean it is actually small. So the book says resize your images. And the book recommends a very famous way to do it without reading the book. What's a great way to edit images? Photoshop. Photoshop. How many of you have any experience in Photoshop? A few people, if not. OK, we offer plenty of classes here at Southwestern College to learn Photoshop. You, you should enroll in that class, CIS 124 or some classes in the art department, I would recommend Photoshop. And um, what I like on page 108 is that it mentions down there on your links, online editors, pixlr.com as a sort of free Photoshop Junior. Nothing to install, nothing to download, free Windows and Mac. You go to pixlr.com. It's right there on page 108. And it lets you edit photos really well, like Photoshop. There's others that are mentioned here, Splash Up and iPicky. I've never used those before. I don't know what to say, but Pixlr, I've used it for years. It's really cool, really easy to use. Pixlr Editor. It's just on the web. And you have all the classic Photoshop tools, cropping, resizing, fixing red eye, all of that. And the express way to edit images too, resizing effects, and so forth. Is mm -hmm. there a standard size that's recommended? No, not really. Sizes are going to depend on what you're trying to what kind of project you're trying to create or what you're trying to show on screen. Uh, so as we get more advanced, I'll mention some suggestions. But um, there's no real sizes, uh, standard sizes, I would say. 107, number 3, also says use pixels. So basically, it says don't use inches or or centimeters for sizing your images. You use pixels. A pixel is a dot on your screen. So if I zoom in, can't really see it. You can kind of start to see it. After I've zoomed in a lot, you can start to see the pixels, the dots that make up this image. There's a dot of this gray color here and a dot of that gray color. And in between, there are several dots. You can almost see them that go between the colors. 
Maybe you can see them there. There's a gray dot, a slightly less gray, less gray, less gray blends into that. So this is pixels, dots. And even on your phone, these phones are so good now, you have to get really, really close to see the dots. But uh, the book is basically saying use pixels as the unit of measurement. The book then goes off to show the difference between JPEGs, GIFs, or GIFs if you want to say it wrong, and so forth. Image dimensions, cropping images. So read the rest of the chapter on your own. Mentions animated GIFs and transparency. Oh, one more thing we'll do, then we'll wrap up the chapter. Page 120. Page 120. We have a couple of new tags to attach a caption to the picture, or like text to appear below the picture. So if you look at page 120, we have the newest code, HTML5 code, figure and figure caption. So we'll back up to our code. To this image, we're going to back up and wrap around the figure tag. So one line before, figure. One line after, slash figure. Because now I've got an element that is a sub-element. I would like to indent that. It was not indented before because this was an element of the whole document of method, basically. And now here, this is a child of this parent element, so I'm going to indent it just for visual differentiation. Images often come with captions. HTML5 introduced a new figure element to contain images and their captions so that the two are associated. After image, fig caption tag, figure caption. This is the caption related to this figure or image. Figure, they use it in terms of it could be a picture, a drawing, a chart, so figure. But here it's an image. So fig caption, the caption associated with this image. And this works because we've got figure wrapping around the whole thing, right? To make sure that you've got figure, then image, then fig caption. This is the association. And then some text. Plate. Uh, some tasty. Chocolate chip cookies. So multiple spaces vertically, yeah. from line to line. Um, so, like you're saying, you're trying to separate the text a little bit more. Yeah. You could, yeah, you could write break, um, break tag. You can write break tag more than once, but CSS is going to be better because then we can specify exactly how much space. We haven't talked about the you know, spacing in CSS, but the short answer for right now, yes, break tag. So here I've got the caption, big caption, there's a picture. That's getting a little small. I'm going to resize it to be 320. Resize that picture to be 320 pixels wide. is how you add a caption below a picture. It's a little bit of a setup. It needs two tags, but that's, that's the way. Can't you just make an image with a 
You can, but the purpose of using the right tag for the right task is that we're doing it the best way. This grouping here is the best way because later when we also use CSS we can attach colors and alignment and all of that. A P is a plain old paragraph. My purpose is I want a caption attached to a picture. So it's a little more code, but this is technically the right way. And we'll see when we're writing code, we want to be as often as possible technically right, using the right techniques, the right code. Yes? Um, can we do a break line in our figure caption? Yep, if we do break first, that'll give you a little bit more space between the two. But CSS will give us more control. We'll get to that a little later. Break in there. In here, we can also put other things. Uh, italicize, you know, emphasis, superscript, all that stuff. But simply for spacing, a break will give you more space, but we're going to say CSS for the win later. Figure plus figure caption. the right way to add a caption to a picture. Use CSS to style design, alignment, space, etc. Okay, so that ends this chapter, page 122. You should look at the code on page 122. And the example on the monitor there looks really nice, but don't be fooled. Uh, it looks so nice because those are graphics that have been designed. Because you see, look at that cool border and look at the size of the font. How do you do that? We haven't learned that code yet. Well, that's not code yet. Those are two images. If you look on page 122 on the code, you will see body tag, h1 tag, and then image tag. So the way that image looks so nice, the way the it says from A to zucchini, the way the reason that the font looks so nice and the colors is because it's a graphic. We can do that with CSS later, changing the size of one letter, the the font and all of that and the colors, that's CSS later. And then that image with that border, well, we have a, a CSS tag to make a border but this border is inside of the picture, and I also see text on top of it, Chocolate Islands. That's a picture that was designed. With CSS, we can do that, but again, we still need about 200 or 300 pages to get to that point. So that's the end of the images chapter. General questions on images? Yeah. You can make something bold with strong, like that, and then you can put emphasis inside of it too. Okay. But I would say don't do it. I almost don't want to do it myself, but you can do it. That's because this is not a problem with HTML or anything like that. This is a problem of design. This is a problem about your English teacher is going to cringe because you don't want to put two types of styling like that on text professionally writing properly in an English class you know 
you don't want to italicize and bold something just from the style aspect of it it's too much strong is enough italics is enough bold and italics at the same time it's too much design wise you saw that I did it and my computer let me but I wouldn't let you in this class Yes. So when we usually add pictures, like when we start to make our own websites, how do we, I guess, get them to stay, to stay, if we have to save them in the same folder? So like for today, I had not saved my image on my Dropbox and it had to be added. Like mm. how do we go about that? What we've done so far is we've added a picture that exists in the folder, but we could have a link here to a picture that exists online. Um, let me. That's a good point. I think I've got a picture. That's true. Um, there's the pros and cons of it. Let's let's give this a try. Actually, just for fun, we've got this picture that you have to have in the folder. Let's look at an example of having a picture that doesn't have to be in the folder. Let's say at the very end of our document, uh, after end of uh, back to top, let's say we'll add another image source. Um, I've got an image you can borrow on one of my websites. So let's set up the code and this time we're going to connect to a picture online which has pros and cons. We'll see. So type that code and then go to the go to this website uh, vmcink.net I have a couple of pictures at the very end of the document, but go to this site first. The address, I don't have the address memorized, but we can borrow the address of a picture, of most pictures online, and put that picture into the source. So what I'm getting at is that if it's a better way to have a picture that is linked, so let's say this cat picture right here. If you right click the picture, I'm in Firefox, copy image location. In other browsers it may say copy URL or something. Just scroll down. There's one picture there, another picture on the, on the right. Right click the picture, copy image location. That's the address to that picture. When you copy that address and paste it into your source, that really long address there, is a link to that picture. Now, that picture doesn't need to be in the folder of my project. So, if your pictures are on a server with an address that you can access, you'll be able to access the picture with its link. Later, we'll, uh, I'll give you access to a server where you can upload your stuff and you'll be able to get to your picture. So, this result... Does the server come with a domain? Um, when you buy a domain, you just get the, the link of the website, right? Yeah, and that'll be a, a lecture that we have also. That Right now, I have this is one of my websites, vmcinc.net, so I have to buy the domain and the server to, to have the whole thing set up, yes. So this picture is not <coughs> in our folder. It's on my server on the Internet, and it shows up in your website, even though it's not in your folder. This is another very common thing to do. Instead of having your picture in your folder, you can link to it if it's on the internet somewhere. Dropbox, I believe, you can right click a picture and it will give you a link to your picture in Dropbox to share and then you can use it in your HTML. Now the downside of this is that if I then uh, on my server change that picture or delete it, the link will break and then on your website you'll have a broken link so I don't have alt text it would just be a weird empty spot so we can have images that we borrow from the internet if we have its full path its address it's on the web this link etc etc there's the picture yes so technically you can create 
make a Facebook, upload a picture there, and then use the page location of that. Pretty much, yeah. Um, if you can, if you can get that, that, that address, definitely. And remember, sometimes, you know, right click might not quite work. So you're always able to go to the source code and kind of explore there and find the picture that way. But yeah, this is the nature of it that any picture online has some address. So we should be able to find the address. See, I've got another one over here. Um, so the picture, an Apple icon hidden in the code, that address. I can copy that and paste it into my website and use that picture. Is there any way you can like secure some of your code, like if you make a website, like if you don't want people to see it or something? It's kind of difficult. The nature of it, it's supposed to be open. This was invented for people to share their code originally. So definitely I would want to hide some of my code, but it's kind of difficult. It's doable. Like there's ways to disable right click. You can use special code to disable right click, but maybe I can still do on the keyboard the way to display the code. So it's very hard to fully secure your code without a lot of effort. Okay. Um, that was our chapter five of images. We have more to images to talk about later. It's chapter six. Chapter six, honestly, is always the, the hard one to do, the annoying one to teach. Tables are annoying. Tables are annoying to, to design in plain old HTML. When you have other software like Dreamweaver or WordPress tables are much easier to design. Uh, so this is definitely one you'll want to read and reread and practice on. Remember, uh, tomorrow is our lab day. Uh, tomorrow is a day that if you if you come, you can practice all of the code we've done up to this point. There's no homework yet. Tomorrow will be just a day for you to practice if you'd like to come. So tables might be a good reason why you come tomorrow to practice. Page 130 shows you a pretty complex example of tables over at the Reuters website. You know, the stock market, the stock market charts and such. Oh, look at that, this book is so old, it shows that the Dow is at 12,000. If you don't know what we're talking about, we'll have a, a little lesson on the stock market later, actually, for fun. But there's a chart there rows and columns and information and on on the left side there's a you know, stock market information we can make tables we start with page 131 our tables will look really basic and ugly until we get to CSS so we've got this project we've got some recipes Let's say I want to make a table of nutritional information for the snickerdoodle. I want to write its calories and its fat content and what else, protein and all of that. That'd be nice for a table, table of information. So I'm going to find the snickerdoodle section. We've got ingredients, method. We'll make a new sort of section of nutritional information and then the table so let's see snickerdoodle method before back to top line 54 h4 nutritional facts nutritional facts So a table is rows and columns, but designing it with HTML is kind of tricky because the HTML is so non-visual. I know what a row and a column is, but with the code here, it's going to be pretty confusing. 
first thing we need is the table tag. Open and close. This is going to say, here will be rows and columns. Now the book doesn't mention it yet, but I'm going to add an attribute, border 1. Your, board, your table will be invisible unless you style it with CSS or with the basic border attribute. I think to teach this, you should mention this right away. The book doesn't mention it until like seven pages later. And we have this invisible table that looks weird. Let's actually see our table with a border of one. OK, so then we define rows, tr tag table row. Table row. If I want to make another row, I need another TR pair. Let's make one more one more row. Okay, so I've got two rows. Columns. There is no table column tag. This is why it's confusing. Table columns are dependent upon the number of cells you create, the number of boxes. If I create one box in table row 1, I have one column. If I create two boxes in the first table row, I have two <laughs> columns. So every cell is dependent to create a column. Table cell is TD, table data. Table data, a cell. Columns are based on cells. For the moment, to wrap our minds around it, we'll write here. Row 1, cell 1. Save it and run it. It's not complete yet. Let's save it and run it, see what we have so far. And the table, one row, second row, one cell in the first row, nothing in the second row yet. So I get a little box, row one, cell one. We'll create another cell. So after this first TD, another TD for another cell, row one, cell two. So every cell needs the TD pair. Row one, cell two. So there's no such thing as a column tag, but I've got a first column and a second column because of a cell in a row. You create row 2, cell 1. Go to your second row and create row 2, cell 1. Cell 1. 
cells. TRs are rows. Table is the table. There's no columns. There's no column here, but it has to complete. It has to complete itself, so there's an empty cell here. It doesn't exist yet. I don't have T. I don't have a second TD. Now this is the reason why I want to add border one. You don't have to do this, but if I remove border, it looks like this. Weird. I can't quite tell what I'm doing. So with border one, you can see something at least. That's visible. Okay, well, it, maybe it's not so complex yet, but as you try to create tables with a lot of data and visual interest and all of that, then they get more complex. So if we're kind of understanding it vaguely, I'm going to create row 2, cell 2, just to fill in this box. Then I'm going to go back and fill in real things here. Calories, um, what else is there? Calories, protein, fat, sugar, you know, a couple of headings here, and then data. So, TD, row 2, cell 2. And I want column headings. Calories, sugar, fat, protein. I want four. You can make them up. I want four cells here on the first row with real names. Calories, sugar, protein, fat. Calories, sugar. I need another column, so another TD. I know I'm going to do two more, so copy and paste might help. If you've got the autocomplete, that helps too, but copy and paste. So calorie sugar, protein fat. So I need two of those. I'm filling in real content. Those two cells don't exist, so they're empty. Each cell is kind of big enough to store the information and no more. Notice how small that cell is. And yes, there's a way to have properly spaced cells. Guess how? CSS. CSS. That's going to be the answer for the next 200 pages. So I've got cells that we can style later. Calorie, sugar, protein, fat, and then we'll fill in some values. We'll make this up. Calories. Row 2, cell 1, 100. Sure. And then we've got sugar. Uh, I don't know, 15 grams. Protein, 3 grams. And fat, 25 grams. Two rows, four columns, data in a table. So as always, uh, we use the right tag for the right task. Doesn't this look like there should be a heading? Usually a, a heading of a table is, looks a little different than the data. We have a tag for that. Instead of TH, sorry, instead of TD, we have TH, table heading. These should be headings. 
of the table, not just plain old cells. Just like we have a heading 1 to delineate a nice big and bold block of text, and P as plain text, we have TD as the plain cell, and TH as the heading. Now we do have to go back into each one of these, change those. So this note that I made here, table data TD, I'm going to move it eventually down to here, because these will need to be TH, 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 TH. TH, close TH, TH, table heading, the right tag for the right task. of TH is that it marks it as a heading, yes, but it also styles it a little bit, and then we can restyle it with CSS later. If we want to use the right tag for the right task, we could have simply written strong, but it's not the right tag for the right task. We always want to use the right tag to accomplish what we're trying to accomplish. Old style of web design was kind of faking it by using a tag that kind of did what I wanted, but not exactly. People would often use, in the old days, a table to design columns in a website. I want a left column and I want a right column. So we can make a design with a table, but that's not the right task for a table. You want to avoid it in modern web design. Don't use a table to make columns in your design and a header and footer and all of that. That is so 1990s. You want to use CSS, and I love the 90s, but not tables in the 90s. Uh, you want to use CSS to make rows <coughs> and footers and headers and all that good stuff. So tables are for data to display information, not to make columns and headers and all that design. Got that table. So have you figured this out? You can actually drag and drop your code. Or did I mention it before? You can drag and drop your code. This code right here, I actually want to move it over to here. You can just select your code and drag it and drop it like an icon. Because this TD, that's not a TD anymore, is it? A TH. So I move that code, drag and drop, or cut and paste. Drag it down to the TD and make a note right here. That's a table heading. Only used for the headings in a table. first row of a table usually is a heading, so we mark it as a th. Let's say I want to add another row of information. So we'll add the TR tag after our current after our current row. <clears throat> Use to your advantage the uh, 
highlighting. When you click on a tag, it highlights its pair. When you get complex like that, that'll help you make sure that your code is right. You need a new TR, a new row. We'll create one TD, one cell. Let's just write something like comment. How many columns do we have at the moment in our table? In which row? Uh, the first row. Four. We have four columns. So what we can do is we can span a cell. We can have it span more than one column. Right now, comment is only spanning one column. Right? The, this first TD is below that first T, which is below the first TH, one column. I want this comment to span three columns. So we can add an attribute to span three columns. This is page 133. We have a tag, we have an attribute called call span, column span. We add it to the cell we're spanning. So we'll back up to this cell, attribute call span 3. I want this cell to span 3 columns, take up the space of 3 columns. Page 133 and 134 introduce spanning columns and spanning rows. Right now we've been doing this, that these span here. There is also a row span. Row span equals x. So we can span these two here. But you don't, you don't want to do row span and column span just for design. You want to do it for a purpose. Page 133 and 134 mention a great purpose. 133 shows like a class schedule. Monday and Tuesday, 9 a.m., 10 a.m., 11 a.m., 12 noon. On Monday from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m., or 9 a.m. to 10 a.m., I've got geography. And on Tuesday from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m., I've got gym. So that's a reason why we do column spans. Um, if you want to span rows, that's from top to bottom. There's the example there of a time, like of a TV time schedule. On channel ABC, from 6 to 8 p.m., it's a movie. On the BBC, from 6 to 7, it's comedy. And uh, from 7 to 8, it's sport. So check those two pages. In this case, I don't really have to span anything vertically. I don't need a, I don't need a row span. And here, a column span makes sense to write a comment. The comment will be serving two cookies. Pages 135 and 136, you can look at that on your own. If you have a really long table, we have the concept of the table head, the table body, and the table foot. Our table here isn't big enough to really need that. Look on page 136, 
there's a really long table there of dates, income, expenditures. It's a long table. So we would need the head of the table, the main body of the table, the foot of the table. That's something you can practice on your own tomorrow. Pages 137 and 38 mentions, mention the old way to add color to your tables and to the sizes and all of that. You can look at it for historical purposes, but don't do it. Page 138 mentions the border, which we did. Whoops, I did what I said not to do. But just so that we can see the table, I'm going to allow the border. Better ways with CSS, we can add better borders in CSS like dotted lines and drop shadows and all that nice stuff. But at least we can see the table here. So old code, whenever there's a page that says old code, don't do it because it's old. But it's good to have it as a reference in case you need to work on someone's website that has old code. Question? Do you typically create a table with HTML and then make it pretty with CSS? Or do you make a table with CSS and then like The first way. So make a table. You want the basic structure with HTML and then the design with CSS. Gotcha. Page 140 ends the chapter, and there's an example there of making another table. So for more practice, you can make that kind of table, experiment with some of the values and such. Questions then on the tables chapter. We have a little bit more time to start the forms chapter. Let's see how far we get on that one. Forms. This is a pretty fun chapter. This is to make forms like a contact form, feedback form, user registration form. Now, spoiler alert. We're going to be able to design these forms, but they won't do anything until we get to JavaScript. So we can set up the look of it and the style, but the functionality we cannot get to until much later. That's much more complex. What do you do with that input? Verify they type their name right, all of that. That requires interactivity. And as I said on previous days, HTML is, is, is structure, CSS is design, JavaScript is interactivity, like filling out a form. Let's see, so page, page 148 gives you examples of form elements that we can create. Text inputs, passwords, check boxes, buttons. We can do all of that through HTML simply the design of those things. For them to do anything, that's JavaScript. One of the most famous forms is the Google homepage. Google, the most visited website in the world, that's a form, an input field to search for something, and you click search. That's a form. A lot of processing happens behind the scenes for your search term to give you a result. Page 149, step one, you create a form, a user fills it out. Step two, each form element has a name. Step three, the data is sent to a server where it processes it, such as with PHP, C Sharp, Visual Basic, Java, JavaScript, maybe interfaces with a database. Step four, the data comes back to the user. A form has data to process. So let's say in our site here, we've got this um, project. It's called Chapter 3. We're not even on Chapter 3 anymore. Let's change the name of this. This looks like it's a website for something. What well, should we rename this project to instead of Chapter 3? This looks like some sort of store or website about a company, maybe. 
Cookie Paradise. Perfect. I will call this Cookie Paradise. It's about cookies and recipes. Um, in this particular case, I've got the recipes. Later on, I could have other things like a blog and videos. But this, that's this website. Recipes, okay, great. We've got all of this stuff. Uh, definitions, that picture. I'm gonna, that picture is nice. But I'm going to comment it out. I don't want to delete it. I may want that picture later, but I don't want it visible on screen. Let's comment if you did my cat picture here. That is my cat helping me make my website. Uh, I want to comment out that picture. Uh, I want to deactivate the code. So if you wrap the comment tag around it, it deactivates it. In my case, green deactivates it. While we're here, uh, why not change a little bit down here? This is no longer a template. This is our Cookie Paradise project. Today's date, description, a website all about cookies. The title tag of this project still says June 12th or something, so change that on your own. Change the title. But anyway, I'm getting at, I want to uh, create a form, like a contact form. I'll create a new section with a heading 2. I have a whole big section about recipes, then subsections. I want another heading two is a whole big section of for contact. So we will say um, after back to top, heading two. Contact us. Uh, we might not have a lot of time for it, but I would like for you to put a new item. Well, never mind. Those, those are the recipes. I was going to say you could put a new item, contact, to jump down to contact, like we have these. But this is under recipes. It wouldn't quite make sense. Uh, but you can practice that. Anyway, we've got a new section for contact us. And I want to start to make a form, page 151. Fifty one mentions a couple of other attributes here action, method, and ID. For the moment, we, we won't bother with those yet. Uh, action, method, and ID. We're not at a point where we can actually process the data here yet. If you look at the example code, there's form action equals a web address on example.com slash subscribe.php. That would be the extra 
code that processes this feedback form, example.com method of get. We want to connect to that server. So we're going to skip that. I won't add a, an action or a form, uh, an action or a method yet. And then an ID would be further for styling or uh, JavaScript. So this is enough to create a basic form that won't do anything. And that's OK, because we can't make it do anything yet. The book mentions the more correct way to do what we're about to do on page 163. Um, we're going to do an input box. Well, we'll get back to 163 in a moment. Let's do this first. Uh, input. Input tag does not have a pair. The input element is used to create several different form controls. The value of the type attribute determines what kind of input they will be creating. Page 152. Attribute type. A text input. I want people to type text here. There are other types, yes. We'll look at that later. Save it and run it. You'll get your form. All that it is is a box where you can type text. Numbers, too, yes. And symbols, yes. So here's Yosemite Sam yelling at me in the contact form. It's an input type text. One tag, it's only the opening tag, but with an attribute, text. I'm going to ask for the person's name, email, and their comment. So before that, if I type name, uh, the text of name appears on screen right there. Uh, technically, I did not put a space after name. So there's no space there. I want a space, name, colon, space. I'm asking for the person's name here. Contact us. What's your name? Well, before we go further, this is when we'll jump back to the later pages. The book uses a paragraph on page 152. It uses a P for paragraph username. Well, on 163, the better way to do this is to use a label. A label is the text that will appear on screen that is related to the input element. So we're going to wrap label around name. It has a pair. This is a visual label for this input field. When introducing form controls, the code we wrote was kept simple by indicating the purpose of each one. However, each form control should have its own label element, as this makes the form accessible to vision-impaired users. When we added that alt text to the image, that was for people with a visual impairment, so that they could see my site, use my site. Uh, labels are another way to make your forms accessible so that people can actually use the form properly. To finish using this label tag, this needs an attribute, label, for, F-O-R. This label is being used for or attached to this input here. This is being used for this. So this needs a name that we can make up 
And this needs the name, the same name, connected. So we'll call this input name. We're making this up. It'll be called kitty cat, and it'll work just fine. This is an input field for the person's name. Input for their email. Input for their age. Making it however we want. This label is being used for this input, this name. So this needs the attribute of name. The name of this input field is input name, which then links the two together. This is the right way to do it. Name. Input name. The for attribute states which form control or input field the label belongs to. Visually, it looks exactly the same as a moment ago, but this is the correct way. So a moment ago, that's before, that's after. Visually, exactly the same. But internally in the code, this is more correct. This is the right way to do it. Yes? Name attribute, ID attribute. Uh, the purpose of the name attribute is for this, so that these two are linked. The ID attribute is often used for CSS styling as an anchor to attach to it, or JavaScript, so that we can c capture that information. So simply name links the label and the input, and ID for more powerful things, JavaScript and CSS. So I Mm -hmm. Yeah, we used ID as a way for us to link, you know, from the top to the bottom. So ID is more for like an action? Exactly. ID is more for an action often with JavaScript or links, CSS, to do something. Name is just to kind of mark it. These two are related, but ID is often for a, kind of an action. So here I'm asking for the person's name. Next, I want to add for the person's ask for the person's email. Uh, I'm going to add a break here, and then I'm going to copy this whole chunk here because I need to do the same thing: a label for something, asking for something, input some kind, something. So instead of retyping the whole thing, I'm going to add a break at the end and then copy the whole line, paste it. Break the line so that the input is on the next line. And then copy the exact same input and we'll change a couple of things. So we're asking for an email now. So save some effort here. If you typed it right and it worked properly the first time, copy and paste. Just save some effort. I'm asking for email. Up here I've been asking input type, text, and text. This will work. But the book mentions a little bit later, the modern way to ask for an email is a box of type email. This is cool because it will, it will that box now will only accept email addresses. Text will accept anything. And a person can type any fake thing they want. I only want people to type an email address there. label to link the text to an input field its name Input 
text accepts any text number symbol type input type email only accepts emails there's other input types uh, have you ever seen a form where you where it asks for the date and you click and a little calendar pops up we have that as well type of calendar uh, we have other ones type of search a search box type of password is the most basic one. You can type anything there. Input type of email only accepts email. There's another one for telephone. People type what they type there can only be a phone number. Now here, visually for people, this is correct. Email type. Internally, something's not right. Between my, my current input, the name. The name. I, I cannot, I should not reuse the same name. This has a unique name of input name with its label. And this one has the same one. So there's going to be problems here. I want a new name for this input field. And therefore it's, it's appropriate label. What's a good name instead? Input email. Perfect. So input email. for input email. Since we're about to wrap up, we'll do the last item. Another input, type, submit, a submit button. basic ones and then advanced ones via JavaScript. So input type submit, submit query. If you click on that, nothing really happens. If you type your name, if you type your name, if you type something in the email and try to submit, it'll pop up. Please enter an email address. That's the point of having type equals email. It validates. In the old days, we had to write a bunch of JavaScript to validate, did they type an email here? Now, with HTML5, it's built in. Type equals email, and it validates. OK, well, an email is in the pattern of something at something dot something. Click on that, and, and it's fine. Nothing happens, but I have the right type here. And we'll look at other types a little later. Uh, yes? And when, you're, when you refresh it, it's down. No, I, I keep scrolling down. I'm just pressing oh, no, no. N. I'm sorry. The, the, actually, the contact, the contact box, boxes are down from each other. They're vertical uh. or minor horizontal. You might have forgotten to add a break at the end of the line. Oh, okay. And that's going to be for each line? We'll add the break there? Uh -huh. At the end of the line of that input, break it. Next input, break it. And then the final okay. submit button. So I've never seen a website when you fill it in, it says submit query. I'm not a robot. What do you usually see on one of these little buttons? submit or go or okay or save so we can rewrite 
what's in that uh, input by giving it a new value. This is um, page one sixty. Submit button. Type submit. The submit button is used to send a form to the server. We have no server, so it doesn't do anything. Name attribute. We can use name, but not required. Value. The value attribute is used to control the text that appears in the button. It's a good idea to specify the words you want to appear on the button because the default value of the button on some browsers is submit query. And this might not be appropriate for all kinds of forms. Looks weird. Different browsers will show submit buttons in different ways and tend to fit the visual presentation of the browser. If you want to control the appearance of the submit button, CSS. So there's a very simple contact form. It does nothing, but at least it has some validation. If you try to put in something besides an email address there, it'll say, please put an email address. And there's other kinds of types. You know, there's number. This will only accept numbers. If I try to put letters and then go, it'll say, please enter a number. So we have other types that are in the book. We'll look at them when we come back next time, or you can look at them on your own. But what type of info are we inputting? We're going to wrap up in a moment. Uh, when we continue the lecture next time, we'll continue with a few more form things, a couple more chapters. We'll get close to the CSS chapter. Then there'll be a homework. Probably next week will be the first homework. To have, uh, we'll have a homework on the the first HTML um, chapter. Then after that, we'll start CSS, do a few days of CSS, then do a homework on CSS plus HTML and moving forward. So I'm going to leave this as text. I'm going to put my code in the network folder in just a moment. We can review it. I'm going to upload this to Blackboard. Any general questions on things we talked about today? OK, so that's it for the moment. Tomorrow, again, is the lab day. And I'll be here if you need lab help.